This past week we were reading some things that uh, led to this topic, the purpose of God's law. I would say in general we have part of the story, but we want to have the whole story in regard to God's law. Psalm 111 verses 7 and 8 say, all his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. So we find in many, many places of the Bible the law is spoken of in a very positive manner. And this is one of them. It is totally true. There's nothing in it that's not upright. And those commandments are guaranteed to work. They are sure. Now here's the text that whenever we talk about the role of the law, this is usually the one that we use. But it's only a partial um, biblical message. And yet it may have stereotyped our thinking and the thinking of others. In Romans 3.20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Now, <clears throat> essentially, the battle that Paul was having was with what we call legalists, people that were trying by their own power to obey the law. And that's why he put it this way. And for that kind of individual, they need to realize, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But that's not all there is to the law. And here's the other part. Found in Psalm 19, verse 7, and it is repeated several times in the book of Psalms. The law of the Lord is perfect. And what does the law do? Converting the soul. So the law is more than a mirror, more than something to see where there's something wrong with us. But there is power in the law. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now we're going to touch on a number of things that the law does, but uh, I'm not going to emphasize all of them equally. It says here that the law makes a person wise who other than that would be simple or in other words they would be lacking in knowledge but when they uh, have the law then they become wise and of course that's easy to see why uh, God is the one that uh, has informed us about the law and it's therefore his wisdom that he's informing us about. And if we will pay attention to it, it will make us wise as well. In a letter, 22, 1894, those who delight in the law of God are not under the law. You know, the Bible in several places talks about uh, being under the law. But if you really like the law, if you delight in it, then you won't be under it. For the law of God is an instrument of strength to them. So for those that delight in the law, the law is an instrument of strength to them. It's a wall of protection for them. It's a refuge for guardianship and does not bring condemnation. 
For to those who are in harmony with it, it is holy, just, and good. They can declare that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Well, it'll explain more as we go, but I think you can see from this that if we separate the law from God, we've made a mistake. Because the law cannot be separated from Jesus. It's, it's integrally involved. And because it is, the law has the same power because of who it's connected to. And that's with Jesus. So, uh, obviously, if we delight in the law, we've had what the Bible would call a conversion. Because the legalist uh, secretly wishes they didn't have to do it, but because they want heaven, they you know, grit their teeth and try to do it. But when a person has been converted, now the law is written on their heart, and now the law is a delight to them. And because it's a delight, there's power in the law to obey. And there is protection in the law. And there is uh, a refuge in the law. And of course, it doesn't condemn them either. In another uh, letter, 115, 1902, there can be no genuine liberty without perfect obedience to the law of God. An obedience so glad, so willing, that the restraint of the law is not felt. Why? Because the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So here it tells us that if you really want to be free, you have to obey the law. And not an obedience, which is something you wish you didn't have to do, but it's something you're praising God you can do. You're happy that you can do it. You're not struggling to want to do it. You are willing to do it. And to that kind of person, the law doesn't seem like any restriction whatsoever. Doesn't that sound like a benefit that we ought to seek for? To where we can be like that? Where the restraint of the law is not felt? And our obedience makes us happy, and it, it's not a struggle to want to do it. We are very willing to do it. Amen. Here we connect why this can be true of God's law in Signs of the Times of June 5, 1901. God's law is the expression of his character. So when God wrote the Ten Commandments on those tables of stone, he was simply describing his own character. And for anyone that allows him to live in them, he is going to live out his character in their life. Now, of course, it, it keeps increasing. It's not all there the moment you accept Christ, but it a big chunk of it's there, and then it keeps growing because as you seek to obey the law, more and more of his character is being shown through you. If we don't keep the character uh, or the law, then his character is hindered from shining through us. So this brings an urgency to keep the law in all of its areas because the more we keep it, the more his character is being expressed through us. Christ Object Lessons 128. No man can rightly present the law of God without the gospel. Now, the gospel has been separated from the law to a very large degree. 
But here it says, no man can rightly present the law of God without the gospel or the gospel without the law. Why? When we talk about the law, we're talking about the same person. We're talking about the gospel, we're talking about Jesus. When we're talking about the law, we need to understand we're talking about Jesus. The law is the gospel embodied. And the gospel is the law unfolded. See how closely tied together they are? The law is the gospel embodied. So when we read the law, we're reading the gospel, if we understand it right. It's, it's a list of promises. God says, I'll make you like this and like this and like this, and I'll make you like all these things that I have here. So the gospel is embodied in the law. But when we study the gospel, we're studying the law. We're studying our insurance policy about all the benefits that come from obeying the law. And so uh, the law is the gospel embodied, and the gospel is the law unfolded. The law is the root. It's interesting where it puts the law. The law is the root. That's where all the nourishment comes from, right? Comes to the root first. The law is the root. The gospel is the fragrant blossom and fruit which it bears. So when we see those beautiful flowers, we're seeing the result of the law or the fruit that we can eat. It's the result of the law. Why? Because the law is the expression of his character. And that's why David could say in Psalm 119, verse 32, I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. He was no legalist. Uh, he recognized without God, none of this is possible. But he said, when you enlarge my heart, or as you enlarge my heart, I will just enjoy those commandments. I will run the way of thy commandments. Not walk or, you know, stop and start, but I will run the way of thy commandments. In a letter 155, 1902, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Through obedience comes sanctification of body, soul, and spirit. So, obedience to the law is only possible through his power, but to anyone who has accepted his power, as they seek to obey more and more carefully the law, the more carefully they obey it, the more sanctified they are of body, soul, and spirit. This sanctification is a progressive work, an advance from one stage of perfection to another. So again, it doesn't happen all at one time, but as we learn to love the law more and more, and to consider it a privilege to keep the law, and to want to understand what it is that the law is asking us to do, the more we do that, the more sanctified we become, and the more like Christ we become. In the special testimonies, uh, B, um, 3A, I'm not sure uh, what that is, but that's what the reference they gave. Page 10. The love of Jesus in the soul will banish all hatred, selfishness, and envy. We've been studying what envy does as we studied the brothers of Joseph. And unfortunately, all of us have envy in our hearts, which shows itself 
in situations where somebody seems to be doing better than we are doing or you know other things of that nature that's when envy really starts showing itself so it's one of those things that we have to be delivered from and God works through the law to deliver us from this and selfishness you know I, I don't know of any Christian that does not admit that they're selfish and they need deliverance from it so here we have all this hatred selfishness and envy how does it happen for the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul so God's law because it's connected with Christ and because the law is the expression of Christ the law can deliver us from all these things there is health in obedience to God's law the affections of the obedient are drawn out after God you know there's been kind of a division between the Old and New Testament and most people think that God worked differently in the Old Testament than in the New. But it's not true. He worked the same way in both, in both places. He says clearly, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he works, has always worked the same in all ages. And I think that in the New Testament, possibly people understand better uh, that it requires a relationship with Jesus but it's also in the Old Testament if we look for it uh, it's it's there and it's certainly there in the Psalms of David he's very very clear about that in a letter 106 1896 David learned wisdom from God's dealing with him he confessed his sin, accepted the counsel given him, and obeyed in humility before God. Now here is the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. David accepted the counsel given him, and he obeyed in humility before God. Here's what he didn't do. He made no tirade against the law which he had transgressed. So he didn't try to prove that it wasn't necessary to keep the law or that the law was something bad. He didn't do that. He accepted the fact that the law was a good thing and he had clearly broken it and therefore he, he must confess and ask God to help him obey the law the next time he made no tirade against the law which he had transgressed but exclaimed the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul so he was praising God for the law which of course is always in the hands of Jesus unless we don't let him in then he can't he can't work if we don't let him in but if we let him in then the law is always in his hand he's always working in behalf of those that are willing to pay attention to the law and he's going to help them to be able to do what the law has told them to do in manuscript 11 1901 the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. What does it do? Transforming the character from disobedience to obedience. And the manuscript 130, 1906. The word of the Lord is sure. What is his word? The law. The law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul from all evil devising from all scheming from all crookedness in deal there are also some things that arise from envy and jealousy 
Uh, we see those well developed in the life of Judas. Uh, Judas was constantly uh, scheming because he frequently felt that Jesus didn't do the right thing. Jesus just didn't know how to become popular and if he would just let him control Jesus more that you know things would go better and we'll get this kingdom set up that uh, we thought was coming interesting but obviously he did not have Jesus living in his heart and therefore he didn't get the benefits which are expressed in the law he didn't get those benefits in great controversy there's a familiar quote page 468 <clears throat> if people don't have the law or they look upon the law as something bad so they don't they don't uh, see the benefits of God's law here's what happens to them the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Without the law, men have no just conception of the purity and holiness of God or of their own guilt and uncleanness. So there we see the aspect that without the law, uh, we, we don't have knowledge. We don't realize our condition but you notice it says men have no just conception of the purity and holiness of God or their own guilt and uncleanness they have no true conviction of sin and feel no need of repentance mm -hmm. so this is a very dangerous condition for people to be in how can it be changed? We have to preach the law. But we have to preach it connected with the gospel. Because if we don't preach the law, their eyes don't get open. If they don't realize what God is able to do through his law, they will remain as they have been. Not seeing their lost condition as violators of God's law, they do not realize their need of the atoning blood of Christ. <clears throat> now, some have the idea that, you know, once that people see their need from the law, they don't need the law anymore. <laughs> now, all they need is Jesus. But you see, the two are connected. You can't have one without the other. So if you're going to have Jesus, if you think you're going to have him, you're going to have the law. And the law is going to keep on pointing out the things that are not like Jesus. The hope of salvation is accepted without a radical change of heart or reformation of life. Now here is a problem that doesn't just exist out there, but it exists within the church. Because somehow our mind has been altered by this false view of the law. And as a result, we don't do what David said he did. He was constantly studying the law to find out more of the benefits that he could receive from Jesus. And, you know, it gets down to very minutiae in our life, actually. Any command in the Bible to do anything other than, you know, the old sacrificial system that was set aside, but any other thing that God says that we're supposed to do traces back to God's law. It's all a part of the law. And so there are hundreds of details that we should become familiar with. If we don't become familiar with it, our sanctification will stay small compared to what it could be. But when we find out about it, 
And yes, it calls for a sacrifice. It calls for a change in our behavior sometimes or the way we uh, eat or, or dress or something else. But the more we follow the law, connected to Jesus, of course, because it's his character, then the more sanctified we become, the less likely that we will do something wrong because the more we practice the law, it protects us from doing wrong. Amen. And this is what Jesus is hoping, you know, in this final generation that we'll really uh, get the picture and get the benefits that other people haven't gotten. So the hope of salvation is accepted without a radical change of heart or reformation of life. And, you know, on one side we could say, well, they didn't know. But God would answer the question, did you study to find out about how broad my law is? Did you do that? And many are going to have to say, no, I didn't. I, You know, I knew about the Sabbath and I knew about obeying my parents and I, I knew some of these things, but that's all I knew. I didn't know the rest. The hope of salvation is accepted without a radical change of heart or a reformation of life. Now, the radical change is the conversion part. So, if a person thinks they're a Christian without being converted, <coughs> it's just not going to uh, work. It doesn't really make a person a Christian. But then, because we have accepted Christ, now a reformation of life that continues until our death is supposed to happen. There's no stopping place. There's no place where we've followed everything. There's more yet to be explained to us about the law. And so there's always to be forward movement. In the Southern Watchman of uh, August 11, 1908, in the life of Christ, the principles of the law are made plain. So if we were to just practice everything that Jesus did and carefully examine his life, we would be perfectly obeying the law. And as the Holy Spirit of God touches the heart, as the light of Christ reveals to men their need of his cleansing blood and his justifying righteousness, the law is still an agent in bringing us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. One time justification is not enough. We have to keep being brought to him to receive that justification because we learn more things we have to confess and that we have to change. And so it's a continual work. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Well, in light of this, uh, what is our duty? Sons and daughters, this is the one that we read that sparked uh, my thought on this. Sons and daughters, page 38. Our duty to obey this law is to be the burden of this last message of mercy to the world. Could it be that we have gotten scared of being accused of legalists and so we've kind of downplayed the law and not been preaching it like we are supposed to preach it? And of course, if in our mind the law is over here on tables of stone instead of uh, part of the character of Jesus, you know, maybe that would make some sense, but it's not. Yes, it's on tables of stone, but the law came from his character. Our duty to obey this law is to be the burden 
of this last message of mercy to the world. That's our job, to call people to obedience to the law and teach them how and not downplay the law at all. God's law is not a new thing. It is not holiness created, but holiness made known. So the law is holiness revealed so that we can see what it's like. It is a code of principles expressing mercy, goodness, and love. It presents to fallen humanity the character of God and states plainly the whole duty of man. So every Seventh-day Adventist should really be excited about God's law and the privilege of being able to get other people excited about the blessings of law keeping, the blessings of obedience. And I think if we were doing that, it wouldn't be so hard on us when we learn something new that, oh no, do I have to make this change too? This is so hard to make this change. That would not be our orientation. Instead, we'd be like David, Praise God, you revealed another blessing that I can have uh, because of the law. Now, we are experiencing this one. I think it's not hard to see. Sons and Daughters, page 39. The laws of the nations bear marks of the infirmities and passions of the unrenewed heart. But God's law bears the stamp of the divine. You know, for 50 years, our government has said, it's fine to kill your baby. It's fine to do that. 50 years of that. And uh, some people have experienced the laws in regard to child uh, you know, the privilege of parents to uh, raise their child the way they want to. And the neighbor turns them in for spanking their child. And so the children get removed without any questions. They get removed from the home and taken somewhere else while an investigation is made. Uh, and sometimes they never give them back. And so, you know, we, we've experienced the kind of laws that men come up with. But the law of God is perfect. Absolutely nothing wrong. It's the best way to live. It's the happy way to live. It's the only way to live if you want to be happy. Praise God. Yeah. In Sons and Daughters, page 38, whatever is built upon the authority of man will be overthrown. So everything that departs from the law of God, the time will come that he overturns it all. Whatever is built upon the authority of man will be overthrown, but that which is founded upon the rock of God's immutable word shall stand forever. So, what a blessing it is. And I close with David's longing that we read part of it here in Psalm 119, verses 1 through 6. Blessed are the undefiled in the way. It's like saying the ones that love his law and can't wait to live it all. Uh, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Once we know what is right, then we don't want to go against what is right. And David is pointing that out here. Uh, they also do no iniquity. Why? Because they walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts 
how? Diligently, not just halfway, not just partially, but diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. You see, he's, he's looking to Jesus. He says, Jesus, I really want to keep all of the law. Please, live it through me. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. In other words, we keep being ashamed if we find out something that we are not doing. But when the time comes that we are living all of it, then we will uh, be keeping all of the commandments of God. So may the Lord help us as we celebrate this very special service to realize that the reason Jesus died on the cross is because he wouldn't disobey and he demonstrated the benefits of keeping the law his entire life while he was here on earth. And it was also a testimony to us, I can live out my law through you. If you will get to where you like the idea, if you really want it to happen, I will live out my own very character, which is the law through you.